Ignacio Garcia described in Chicanismo, the forging of a militant ethos among Mexican Americans. The movement created a Chicana Chicano political ethos rooted in challenging racism, eradicating poverty, and questioning US imperialism while empowering generations to understand the power of history, the need for culture, and the endless possibilities available if and when we organize. The father of Chicano studies, Dr. Rodolfo Acuña, notes that, quote, the term Chicano became irritant to some, a reminder that they owe a debt to the past, end quote. So as we continue down the next 50 years of celebrating, remembering, and reflect, reflecting on the movement, let's make sure we do not forget what those debts were and continue to document how new debts are taking shape. Let's not forget that we too can say, ya basta. And so it's with these brief thoughts, please join me in welcoming the reigning CSU president of the year, our very own President L Lynette Zelesny. Thank you. Oh, how wonderful. Uh, Professor Moraga, you are so eloquent. And let me just welcome warmly our students, faculty, staff, alumni, friends, and allies. I am so proud to be here in honor of National Hispanic Heritage Month, a time when we pause to observe the culture, contributions, triumphs, history, and ongoing quest for justice and equity in the Latinx community. At CSUB, we celebrate the rich lives of our students every day of the year, and we know that diversity that we champion makes us a stronger university, a stronger region, and a stronger country. And this was demonstrated today by the appointment of the CSU Chancellor Select Joseph Castro, the first Latino to serve the largest public higher education institution in the US. And I'm so proud to have served as his provost at Fresno State. And I'm so proud of this day and this historical moment. On the forefront of our campaign for equity, access and inclusion is CSUB's Latina, Latino Faculty Staff Association, which organized today's event. And we wanna thank you LFSA for being open, inclusive to all and being also role models of empowerment and engagement to all of our students. I look so forward to today's presentation on the Chicano movement and so much of the struggle for civil rights occurred right here in Kern County in Bakersfield, championed by the leaders like Doros Huerta, Cesar Chavez, whose examples still resonate with students, faculty, and staff at CSUB. Dolores still serves on our Latina Latino Advisory Council, and we're so proud that also the grandson of Cesar Chavez, Andres Chavez, also serves on that council with me. We have a very exciting presentation in store for us today. Thank you, thank you, Luis Garza, for joining us and sharing your powerful photographs, stories from the front lines of the Chicano movement. And we find ourselves at a pivotal moment in the life of our country. Each of us make, may, must ask ourselves where we stand in the quest for justice. At CSUB, we stand with our students, all of our students, who are demonstrating courage and leadership for a new day and a brighter, more equitable future. At CSUB, we are runners and we're runners united for change. A warm welcome to our guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President uh, Zelesny, and thank you, Professor Jorge Moraga uh, for, um, for being here. Um, I would like to uh, take a moment and uh, introduce uh, our speaker today. Um, my name is uh, Bill Kelly Jr. I'm a professor of uh, Latin American and Latino art history uh, here at CSUB. Um, Luis uh, Cigarza is, uh, began his artistic career as a photojournalist, um, recording the tumultuous social events of the 1960s and the 70s for La Raza magazine published in Los Angeles from 1967 to 1977. The influential bilingual newspaper magazine provided a voice to the Chicano civil rights movement. As a filmmaker, uh, Luis has created over 50 documentary projects and primetime shows for Los Angeles affiliates like ABC and NBC and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Uh, he's worked for and consulted for such organizations as the Mark Taper Forum and the Getty Conservation Institute. And as a curator, he's led such projects uh, such as uh, Siqueiros in Los Angeles, Censorship Defied, uh, 2010 at the Autry Museum, and served as co-curator for La Raza exhibition 
2016 at the Autry Museum that formed part of the Getty's Pacific Standard Time Los Angeles Latin America initiative. Uh, the archive of photographs numbering over 30,000 film negatives is now uh, housed within the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center. And most recently, the book, La Raza, uh, recently won uh, the Independent Publishers Book Award. So uh, it's with great pleasure I introduce uh, Prof. Maestro Garza to come and speak with us. Bienvenido, Maestro. Muchísimas gracias for the invitation. Um, allow me to switch to the PowerPoint presentation that I'm about to make, okay? And so I will sign off from uh, this wonderful introduction. I much appreciate that, President Zelezny, and uh, to the uh, Latina Latino Faculty and Staff Association, muchísimas gracias for this invitation. And so allow me to begin. Damas y caballeros, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to introduce uh, this following presentation by saying that this is merely a snapshot. It's um, a slight view of uh, a history and a, a slice of La Raza legacy and how it evolves from its humble beginnings to its current state. So we begin by um, with the first issue of La Raza, which uh, is published on the symbolic date of September the 16th, 1967. And it's uh, printed out of the basement of the Episcopalian Church of the Epiphany in Los Angeles in Lincoln Heights under the guise of uh, Father Luce, who provides sanctuary. He provides a home, an incubator, that the first founders, uh, Eliseo Risco and uh, Ruth Robinson, along with a number of other peoples uh, whose names will uh, come about as you research the project further. Uh, but it's a vision of our, our mutual struggle on both sides of the border. The La Raza issue takes hold. It makes us visual for the first time. Uh, in a manner that we were not visual back in that era. Uh, we were not receiving the media coverage, uh, mainstream media coverage. So our voice, along with a number of others that began to uh, uh, be born throughout the Southwest, uh, this becomes our initial steps at, at organizing. Why isn't this not? going down to the next image. Um, it is not moving down to the next image. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, the La Raza becomes a key photographic witness. It becomes a chronicler, an organizing tool of, by, and for the multifaceted Chicano movement. Um, the sparks that uh, shed a light on our struggle is finally making us visible. Uh, so the newspaper at that time begins to cover those uh, issues and those events that are impacting our people throughout the, primarily the Southwest. Um, and so uh, stories of uh, the early farm workers movement with Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez as they begin to organize for better working conditions and uh, a living wage uh, begin to take hold. They begin to create a national consciousness as uh, the farm workers begin to strike and begin to mobilize. And they mobilize in unity with uh, the Filipino farm workers as represented by activist Larry Itliong. Um, so they join forces. They unify under the banner of United Farm Workers Union and they become a force to contend with. And it still continues to this day. It hasn't abated at all. But within the pages of La Raza as well are uh, stories of uh, transnational figures like Bert Corona, who is intergenerational. He uh, comes to us through the labor movement and through immigrant rights struggle. 
uh, he bridges the 40s to the 60s and 70s Chicano movement. He becomes a, a senior mentor to many of us uh, within the Chicano movement as it begins to emerge, as does that of Corky Gonzalez out of Denver, Colorado and the Crusade for Justice. It is uh, an urban movement as well. So we're covering rural, we're covering urban, we're covering uh, movements that are taking place now that are being launched by people like Reyes Lopez Tijerina out of Nueva Mexico, who is struggling for the land grant rights of uh, uh, Mexican citizens of that state that date back to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And he's known as El Tigre, and for good reason. Uh, he's quite a fighter. And out of Crystal City, Texas, uh, comes uh, Jose Angel Gutierrez, who is the founder of La Raza Unida Party, a third party movement that begins to take hold in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. And Jose Angel Gutierrez, along with uh, Reyes Lopez and Corky and um, Cesar and so many others, uh, begin to organize uh, behind the La Raza Unida Party in registering voters uh, to take control of local and city and state offices, political offices for representation. Representation that is sorely lacking within the Republican and Democratic Party at that time. And so that movement grows and it grows into student movements as well within the urban centers of uh, the Southwest and the major cities. And here in Los Angeles, we have a black and brown unity that takes place. It is the early manifestations of uh, students protesting against poor educational opportunities, uh, the desire for a greater curriculum that reflects their ethnic backgrounds, uh, faculty. And uh, in so many ways, uh, the protest is uh, just growing. And uh, the high schools walk out and they walk out by the thousands. Garfield, Lincoln, Roosevelt, Wilson, uh, Jefferson, uh, across the Southwest, thousands and thousands of students walk out and protest against the poor educational conditions that exist. They've improved somewhat, as uh, has just been described by uh, uh, my colleagues here at uh, California State Bakersfield. Uh, progress comes slow, but progress is made and it's made off of those initial protests and movements that were taking place. There is a legacy, there is a baton passing process, and that's what's going on right now. But in that process of covering those stories, I emerge as a photographer. I emerge with my camera, which is my weapon of choice, and I begin to document on behalf of La Raza newspaper and magazine later. And I captured what surrounds me. I capture the imagery of barrio youth, of demonstrations, of gatherings, of rallies, as is shown here in this photograph of these young, brave Chicana Adelitas, who creatively put this poster together that says, Chicano power, viva la raza. And surrounding, it says, on my way to East LA. Or is that on my way to San Jose, as the song goes by Diane Warwick, if you remember that. <laughs> you gotta be a little bit of a generational oldie <laughs> to remember that song. But uh, the insurrection, the uprising of uh, the community, of our youth, of our families, is met by repression, violent repression. The empire strikes back and it strikes back with local, state, and federal forces. And it's, it's a bloody blow that we are dealt. People are imprisoned. People are exiled. People are assassinated. People die for their beliefs in a more just system. Nothing's changed. It still goes on today, as we know. So that the connection between then and now, past is present, is ongoing. We must understand that. Some things 
never change. But la raza is enraged. La raza organizes. And the movimiento is really uh, a Chicano Intifada. It is a long simmering reaction to conquest and internal colonialism that we have suffered within these borders. And so the peak of it is on August 29th, 1970 at the Chicano Moratorium against the war in Vietnam where so many of our youth are nothing but cannon fodder. And so ya basta, we rise, as Maya Angelou would say, we rise to fight. We rise to organize. We bring 30,000 plus people into the streets of East LA. That 30,000 is familia. They come from all walks of life. They come from throughout the country. As depicted in this picture, they are family. They are young, they are old, and they are committed. However, August 29th also has its violent side as police riot and many are killed. And amongst those that are killed that day are Ruben Salazar at the Silver Dollar Cafe. Uh, on this cover of La Raza Issue, uh, you see Ruben, who was an advocate and a strong uh, journalist reporting the conditions that were affecting our community, which many of us believe was the reason why he was killed. He was a critic of the police forces that was suppressing us. And as is demonstrated in this photograph of the La Raza special issue, uh, this photograph is taken by Raul Ruiz, along with Joe Raso, who were co-editors at the time were documenting this particular event. This is just one photograph of many photographs that were part of the exhibition. Uh, and for those of you who saw the La Raza exhibition at the Orchi, you will remember it. And so we continue, we don't abate. We organize, as the labor saying goes, don't mourn, organize, and that's what we do. We organize ourselves, we rally, we demonstrate, we take to the streets, we begin to impact the system in a manner that has never been impacted before. And so for the first time in the history of uh, Mexicanos in this country, you have massive rallies the hundreds of thousands across the Southwest, the Midwest. And we are a part of, not apart from, the largest civil rights struggle which has engulfed the country, if not the world at that time. Uh, the issues were stark for us and for our fellow citizens of this country. So then, as now, there is a great division. And that division. Uh, is met by us having to take the, mag take the newspaper to another level. We morph, we transition into a magazine format, and we go from a 12-page mimeograph newspaper uh, to an 80-page-plus uh, driven um, magazine format. And here you see the first publication, which is uh, the mid-1970 mid is when we come out with the magazine format. And this is a photo a composite of brown berets and young women and young people uh, chanting Chicano power, which becomes uh, a driving force for us to organize and unify our people in a manner that had never been done before. And so it's important that the magazine is a tool, an organizing tool that covers politics, culture, art, and social movements. Uh, within its pages are editorials, uh, content. It is a forum for the activists of that period of time, for the academics, for the intellectuals, for the students. Uh, for the downtrodden who are just trying to express themselves. So it reflects from a range of voices within the pages of La Raza. 
And as you can see on the cover of this particular issue, we are organizing to vote and to register on behalf of the Partido La Raza Unida. And in that organizational effort, it continues to this day. Uh, what's going on in this country today, as you see, in, is the cry for organizing and voting and getting out the vote to change the political system that currently is overwhelming in its negativity. And so uh, we need to get out and vote and register to vote if you haven't. So I cannot strongly emphasize that. It took a, us back then in the day uh, when we were just young millennials with a camera and uh, you have the iPhones of today, which are the uh, equivalent of what we were doing and more and better to tell the stories that face us. And so um, we continue to rally. We continue to demonstrate. And this particular photograph here is uh, taken of uh, La Raza Unida Party rallying and organizing in the streets of East LA. On the lower left-hand side there with the camera in hand is Manuel Barrera, one of the staff photographers and uh, an incredible photographer whose work is part of the archive collection at UCLA. And so um, what happens though, is that this is the late seventies and it is the decline uh, of the movement. It has peaked and it is subsiding. And so uh, publishing La Raza becomes more difficult. And in 1977, it publishes its last issue and the magazine goes dormant. And the collection of photographs and negatives are tucked away, if you will. And it's not until ooh, 40, 45 years later in 2015, thereabouts, that it is reborn. And it is reborn, the semillas, the seeds that we planted 40 years ago have been nurtured. And they are bursting forth in an exhibition that Los Dioses Mandan, how the forces of uh, the Getty Foundation who provides the funding and the resources to mount over 200 exhibitions uh, in museums and gallery spaces that uh, extend from Santa Barbara to San Diego with Los Angeles being the epicenter uh, of the uh, photographic exhibitions. So the idea of exhibiting La Raza and its contents comes about as uh, John Noriega, the director of uh, Chicano Studies Research Center uh, says, Louis, I think we have a, uh, an opportunity to create an exhibition. And so we begin to put together the concept and the idea as we are just beginning to digitize and scan over 30,000 images. Uh, I've already gone through the collection about a dozen times. Uh, I was privileged as a co-curator to do so. And so I became familiar with works that represented uh, my fellow colleagues uh, that I had never seen before. And with the director of the Archer Museum, Rick West, and chief curator, Amy Scott, we begin to build a collaboration, an exhibition, to show the La Raza collection. And on the gallery walls of the museum, the creative team, the design team of the Archer Museum um, translates the inner pages of the newspaper and magazine. And so the words and the images, the graphic artwork, the magazines, as you see in the background and newspapers are mounted. Um, they are gathered to present that history of the magazine that begins in 1967 and ends in 1977. And on the far wall there are the images of the photographers themselves, some of whom have passed away 
and some who still are alive today and still active. Uh, people like Pedro Arias and Daniel Zapata and Maria Marquez Sanchez, Deborah Weber, um, oh, so many others, Patricia Borjón and uh, a number of others. Uh, we never had the money to pay anybody. Everything was volunteer. Uh, you got your name mentioned in the uh, back of the uh, magazine as part of the credit roll uh, as a way of recognizing your participation. But it was all volunteer. It was uh, you paid for your cameras, you paid for your film. And uh, we were students back then, for the most part, uh, with a few seniors and elders who uh, worked with us. And with pen and camera in hand, we trained each other. We passed the baton to one another. We taught each other on the picket line or with a picket sign. It was uh, an incredible period of uh, camaraderie. We overcame obstacles and we faced down uh, the threats that, uh, well, continue to this day. Um, we're under siege and you gotta fight back when you're under siege and that's what we did as a newspaper. We didn't back down. And so, The exhibition begins to show some of the content of 30,000 images that were never seen before. The collaboration between the Autry, Chicano Studies Research Center, the photographers and co-editors of Raul Ruiz and Joe Russell, and uh, all the names that I have mentioned thus far. And there are more, there's just, a, you can do an infinite credit roll that would take hours for all the people that were involved. Uh, but you begin to see imagery that has never been seen before. And the exhibition draws, it draws over a quarter of a million people over one and a half year period that come to see and become so emotionally charged where any number of times I had people telling me, I better understand my parents as they take to the streets themselves and they derive an inspiration. They derive a, a source of, uh, we can do it. We can organize, we can go out and we can confront based on the imagery that they're seeing. It uh, reinforces their belief system. It reinforces their sense of rage uh, and their, their desire to organize. And what can we do? Well, we did it back then with very little resources, but we did it. And today is the same. It's no different. You do what you can with what you got. And what you got takes you to uh, putting together uh, exhibitions, books, documentaries, However, the same issues of a half a century ago still plague us. Um, these words here, the infamy of immigration services, punishment by exile, is taken out of the pages 40 years ago of La Raza. And they apply today. Separations of family, children in cages, the dreamers uh, who uh, are looking for uh, citizenship and the wonderful... Uh, a website to go to is uh, the California Mexico Studies uh, um, uh, Center, uh, run by uh, Professor Armando Vasquez Ramos, uh, who is dealing with DACA and the return of uh, students to travel to Mexico without fear of not being able to return. So you have this push on so many different levels that has taken place over all this time, over all these years. And so we continue to push back. Um, we continue to struggle in a manner that, well, sin la mujer no hay lucha, which is so true. Women are at the forefront, then and now. And the struggle today with Black Lives Matter, uh, gay movement, uh, liberation theology, and uh, uh, the... Uh, Numerous, numerous organizations that are arising uh, to confront the current crisis that this country is undergoing um, is so important for us to understand the historic within a historical context 
of who we are, what we are, where we come from. We have roots, we have deep roots, and we need to realize and respect that and research it because the collection is available at UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center. Contact Javiera Flores, who is the chief archivist and librarian, and she will guide you through for those of you who are interested in um, publications. Uh, La Raza catalog did not come out. <laughs> Ironically, it came out post-exhibition. It came out in January, uh, late January of this year, uh, after the exhibition has closed. But it uh, actually is a good thing um, because it reinforced uh, the exhibition and it's gathering uh, interest and uh, support and uh, the desire to know more about that period of time, which was covered in this book uh, done by Mike Davis and John Wiener. Uh, when they contacted me for use of this particular image, which is mine, um, I told them that, well, La Raza is uh, going to be using it on the catalog. And he said, doesn't matter. We want it. We like it. And so uh, anyway, it came out about a month or so after the La Raza catalog came out. So it's a great compliment. But uh, as well within the collection at UCLA, um, people such as director Philip Rodriguez, who did the uh, Ruben Salazar documentary and the Oscar uh, Costa Brown Buffalo uh, documentary, he was one of the first to tap into the collection, drawing uh, many, many of the images that he used within those documentaries, as a number of other people have begun to do and are continuing to do. So I advise all who are interested from an academic or a filmmaking point of view or whatever, um, if your interest is uh, uh, one that you want to access these images, as I said, contact UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center. And so I am so proud uh, when the catalog first came out, I couldn't contain myself as is, uh, shows in this photograph um, because we are awaiting for the pandemic to subside. And when it does, then we are prepared to travel the exhibition, uh, both within the United States, Mexico, and wherever in the world that there's a desire for this exhibition. So it's... Uh, um, it's an incredible accomplishment by my fellow colleagues from La Raza, uh, from the Autry Museum in UCLA, and for all the families and all the people that attended, because that's the kind of support that creates greater expression to be funded, to be researched, and to be shared. So recently, we won the International Latino Book Awards in these categories. And um, it's never happened before for a museum catalog, exhibition catalog. Uh, this is just one of several awards, and they continue. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's validation. It's a validation of the quality of work that is contained within the uh, the uh, the book uh, of La Raza, which is edited by Colin Gunkel, who did a fantastic job in putting it together. And uh, so it just, what can I say? We will not be intimidated, plain and simple. So this is uh, my recent efforts at uh, translating my photographic work into silkscreen artwork, hand-painted. And um, it's just one example of a number of other examples that we have. So you can contact me later and I will give you more information. Let me put a plug in. And uh, so, adelante, raza. ¿Qué te digo? Um, gracias. Thank you for being a part of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for your time and for the excellent work on that presentation. Um, we, have a, we have a few questions. 
Um, but I wanted to start off by asking you uh, a couple of questions I noted from, from your presentation, Luis, por favor. And, uh, uh, one of the things that I enjoyed so much when I was, um, uh, when I was researching um, uh, a little bit about your show, I, I went to go see it three times. I was lucky enough to have you give me a personal tour one time of the show, and that was a great highlight for me. And uh, one of the things that I was always impressed about La Raza magazine was how it was interested in making connections with other liberation movements across the Americas. It would have been so easy to just focus on your own community, but you were interested in the liberation movement in Puerto Rico. It covered uh, indigenous rights in the Andes. It covered the Tupamaros and the Southern Cone in Uruguay and Argentina. Um, but What compelled uh, La Raza and the staff there to try to make these connections with other uh, liberation movements and other struggles across the hemisphere? You become aware of yourself beyond yourself. Um, I certainly was not a journalist. And many of us were not. Um, but as we begin to put together the journal, the publication, we begin to realize that there is a much larger story. And we begin to realize that we have things in common with other struggles that are going on. I learned much about my own personal history, uh, both from being a young child with my father, and then of course coming into the Chicano movement, I was parachuted into the center of it, where my political education begins to take place. And I think that happened for many of us. And for information that was not provided to us, we began to realize that there is a much larger struggle that surrounds us. And so we connect. We connect and we, we search out that information. And that's what goes into the pages of La Raza. We realize that there's a, an international struggle. Uh, Luis, just, uh, uh, just one piece of housekeeping. Would you mind stopping your screen share, please? Uh, where, oh, stop sharing. Thank yeah. you. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you for taking me through that. Master Luis, uh, one, more, one more question before I answer some of the questions that are coming in through the, um, from the internet. Um, you were a student. Uh, you were a young person when you were involved in this movement, when you started out. Um, uh, And you notice the importance, um, you mentioned the importance of, of art and media, media literacy, you know, as part of your work as a young person, the kind of passing of the baton, as you said. Uh, what advice would you give to young students uh, today uh, who are interested in social change from your own experiences? Keep your curiosity alive. Don't despair. Um, my greatest inspiration came from picking up that camera as a tool, as a medium. It became my razón de ser. It became my grounding and a period of time in my life where I had no direction to roam, as Bob Dylan would sing. Uh, I was somewhat lost in that period of sex, drugs, and rock and roll of that time. Uh, I found a purpose, I found a focus to my life. And it was through the camera and through my involvement with La Raza that I began to grow consciously, subconsciously. Uh, that continues to this day, uh, it doesn't stop. So I, in many ways, am self-educated through the process of photography, documentary, filmmaking, and putting these projects together. Uh, as academics, you know that in order to make a presentation, you've got to do your research. And so that was the case with me. If I had to prepare television documentaries uh, or curate a show or uh, uh, take these photographs, many times in uh, the darkroom as uh, we're developing the images, um, it's a very maternal instinct for me that came about. Because when you're in the darkroom and you're all alone and you're Uh, souping and mixing the chemicals and you're developing the image that appears before you. It's a birthing process. 
it's very much one where the male and female inside of you comes out and saying, I did see what I saw. I didn't know that I saw it as the way I saw it, but as you begin to develop the images, you begin to feel that birthing process as the image evolves before you in the chemicals. And so for me, that was profound. As simplistic as it sounds, it's profound. And so it helped me, it helped guide me. And when I approach the work that I do now, it's instinctual, it's, uh, I'm not academically trained, I'm not formally trained. Uh, I've learned through the process, OJT. I got a PhD in OJT, on-the-job training. And uh, that's how I have evolved. That has always been something that guides me. I have been thrust into positions where you need a degree to get into. And me, without any degrees, I'm in it, and I'm doing it. And so, okay, what do we got to do? Let's do it. And so I get it done, period. That's, uh, that's the hustle. That's the hustle. Um, a couple of people are asking, uh, I think you might have covered some of these, uh, some of these topics. Uh, how did Mr. Garcia feel while at the protest? What was going through his mind? What was he feeling? I think you might have touched on that. Is there anything you, more you would like to expand on? Uh, I correct Mr. Garcia to Mr. Garza. <laughs> Mr. Garza, sorry, he misspelled. <laughs> My fault too. <laughs> That's okay. It happens often. Um, how do you feel when you're in a thunderstorm? When you're in the eye of the hurricane? There's a calmness, and there's also a, a fear, and there's a whirlwind that you're getting swept up in. But as a photographer, you have to maintain a certain distance in order to cover the imagery, and Oftentimes it's on the run, you know, you have a pack of dogs and the police chasing you and you're photographing at the same time and you're, you're loading film to keep on photographing. It's like being a combat photographer in many ways. And often was the case as we attended these demonstrations, we didn't know what was gonna happen, but you pushed on. And so you did the best you can with what you had. And uh, it wasn't always uh, the most peaceful of situations that I entered, uh, as it was for my fellow colleagues. Uh, we put ourselves on the line, and there was a price to pay for that for a number of us. Maestro, uh, one of the questions includes, why photography? What made you pick up a camera as your favorite tool? Um, it's like when you see that perfect woman across the dance hall and you see that she's meant for you. Well, I looked at the <laughs> camera and it became my mate. And so we bonded and it continues to this day and it's the, the best love affair I've ever had. Muy bien. Uh, another question includes, uh, do you have any reflections uh, about the differences or similarities between the civil rights movement and the contemporary movements that are happening now? <clears throat> they are in many ways mirror images of each other um, throughout history. There are many uh, instances where you can say it's a mirror image. And that mirror image uh, has variations. And there are variations of the theme, but there is a theme that uh, one can look at past to present. And we are in that cycle once again. Um, past is present is future. It ain't over. These elections that are coming up have a profound impact. And uh, stay tuned. It's going to be a rocky road. Mm. Um, one other question uh, is, uh, is there a favorite experience behind a photograph or a favorite photograph? Oh, not any one in particular. Um, as I look at the body of my work, which uh, you know I hadn't done to the degree that I've been doing lately, uh, I see the evolution of my photographic eye. I see the early young photographer trying to learn the craft, 
to the one who becomes a bit more polished uh, in terms of composing and framing. And uh, during the process of uh, learning the technology of the camera and uh, the emotion that is captured by the camera, it is ultimately you as the photographer who conveys the image. So I would study other photographers. I would study cinematographers. I would go to museums and I would look at the composition of paintings, past and present. Looking at, looking at art is the best way to, to be an artist, right? You learn, as, uh, as uh, I think it was um, Picasso who said, uh, I don't borrow, I steal. Uh, something to that effect. <laughs> we all learn from each other, you know. Uh, and so you draw, you draw upon the inspiration source from wherever it is, you know. And, and in many ways, uh, um, uh, that's how you evolve. You begin to appreciate the work. Uh, you, as my mentor, Margot Albert, used to say to me, Luisito, you have much to learn, but you have to learn. You have to practice constantly. You cannot sit idle. Practice, practice, practice. And that's what I did. Maestro, we have a very intriguing question here. It says, uh, like in the 60s, there is a common sentiment among young Latinos of Mexican American descent who do not feel completely accepted by the cultures they represent. Sometimes we feel we are not Mexican enough to be Mexican and we are not completely accepted by American culture. We all know that feeling, do you think we will see a modern day rebirth of the Chicano movement? Um, whatever brand that you want to place upon yourself, be you Central American, Latin American, Caribe, um, whatever sensibility you have in terms of who you are and what you are, I take great pride in uh, my background. I come out of New York City. I'm born and raised in New York City. My family comes out of Northern Mexico, Coahuila, and uh, um, South Texas. They migrate to New York in the mid 1920s uh, where I have a small colony of my family. I grew up amongst Irish, Jewish, Italian, Puerto Ricans, Boricuas, Blacks, I mean, you name it. And all of those people influenced me profoundly. Uh, so I draw from that experience and being Mexicano was always instilled in me by my parents. There was never a negative sensibility about who I was. In fact, I was unique being the only Mexican in the neighborhood. So I took great pride in that. I didn't let that put me down. And for those who attempted to put me down, ah, you brush them off. Okay. Learn who you are. Take pride in who you are, research who you are, learn those roots and share those roots is what we did with La Raza newspaper magazine. And we shared it in the most magnificent way possible with the exhibition at the Archie Museum. And we will continue to do so. Very well put, Maestro, thank you. Um, a couple of people are asking, what's, what's the way forward? <laughs> What's the way forward? Uh, for who? <laughs> it's individual. It's uh, it's uh, family. It's uh, it's uh, it's extended family. It's uh, for all of us to consider that question. I don't have an answer for for anyone beyond myself. Uh, I'm an observer. As a photographer, I have a certain distance, but I have a certain intimacy with the subjects that I photograph. And in many cases, it's a, it's a bond that is immediate, it's sensory, it's micro, micro nanoseconds to capture some of the imagery that I captured and not realizing, but realizing what I was capturing. That's why I refer back to the darkroom as a maternal instinct in me. It's a birthing experience. And so it's, uh, it's profound in that sensibility. Um, going forward is... Uh, Something that we all have to ask each other, how will we do that individually and together? It goes without saying, I assume, Maestro, that you're still hopeful. Oh, by all means, by all <laughs> means. I'm an optimistic cynic. 
<laughs> Define that, please. <laughs> <laughs> I have my doubts, but I don't let my doubts hold me back. <laughs> well put. Well put. Um, do we have time for one more question, Faust, or are we, or are we reaching our uh, time? Yes, yes, we do. We still have time for one more question. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given, Maestro? <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> dare i say uh, <laughs> um i think one of the most inspirational lines comes from my father when i had returned to, back to new york and i was a bit of a flower child hippie and uh, my father looked at me uh, after slamming the door in my face and accusing me of being a hippie and he said to me mijo I don't know if you're going to make it. And uh, I took that to heart. I never forgot that line. I don't know if you're going to make it. You see, he had doubts what he was seeing surface wise. And that made me look inside of myself saying, why is my father having doubts about me? And as we all go through life, there are moments of despair. There are moments where you don't know that you're over, going to be able to overcome the, the desert, the mud that you're walking through. And uh, you find your way. At least some do. Some don't. I've experienced that feeling. But I overcame. Like my Angelou says, and still I rise. Very good. Thank you, Maestro, for your time. Uh, Faust, I turn it over to you. I thank you very much again for the amazing presentations. This is a momentous week to celebrate so much of the history of our communities, particularly here in the Central Valley. And so uh, uh, personally, on my, on my own behalf, I want to thank you, Maestro, for, for your time and your, your continued support of, of arts and culture for, for our communities and, and for everyone. Well, I, I want to thank everyone who tuned in to this Zoom cast and bear with me in my uh, attempts to uh, get online. Uh, I should only get better. As I said before, it's practice, practice, practice. And uh, I would hope that we can have this conversation continue in a number of other formats. So again, thank you for inviting me and participating in this 50th anniversary. Mr. Garza, uh, thank you so much for joining us today on behalf of California State University Bakersfield and the Latina, Latino Faculty and Staff Association. We're just honored and, and blessed to have you here and, and see all the great work you've done uh, and the collection you've been able to build. Thank you so very much and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Adios everybody and uh, Adios. You can contact me on Facebook, go to my site and visit it, and you'll catch a whole lot more information about me and my history and the work that I'm doing. And um, let's keep the conversation going.